Hello students, it's Dr. Yu. In this lecture series, we're going to talk about making PowerPoints. We're going to learn how to apply the things we learned from data visualization and now apply it to an actual PowerPoint presentation. To start, let's talk a little psychology and neuroscience. There was an author named Dave Crenshaw, who is also a neuroscientist, and he wrote a book called The Myth, Myth of Multitasking. And what he basically argued was that humans do not actually multitask, or at the very least, don't multitask well. What humans actually do is something called switch tasking. What does that all mean? Well, here's what that means. If you think of the human mind, there are only really two things that humans can do at once and only to certain degrees. So think of your brain as having two tracks. The first track is what we call the pri powerful primary, or that's the way I want you to remember it, is the powerful primary. The powerful primary is your attention being focused on a task and doing it quite well, because that's where most of your attention is going. But your brain can also do a second thing, and I call it the so-so secondary. Your brain can try to do two things at once, but it's gonna do one thing very powerfully one thing sort of okay, but with mistakes and errors, and it cannot do a third thing well at all. So here are some examples. Texting and driving. It's a huge no-no for a reason. Because you're incapable of multitasking, what's going to happen is, if you try to text, the text is going to take over the powerful primary, and your driving is going to take over the so-so secondary. It's not the case that you can have two powerful primaries at the same time. So your brain is going to switch between one being powerful and one being so-so. So every time you look at the road, you switch to powerful primary. But then when you look back down on the screen, texting becomes the powerful primary and driving becomes a so-so secondary. And we can already imagine the problem of texting and driving. If your driving becomes the so-so secondary where you're going to make mistakes and errors, those two or three seconds that you're looking at your phone are two or three seconds of reaction time that you're missing out on, and that's the difference between breaking behind a car without hitting it and hitting a car and breaking too late. So that's why texting and driving isn't advisable and generally is illegal in many states. But now there are some exceptions to this. For example, if you are listening to classical music and doing homework, well then, you're doing the homework in the powerful primary, and you're listening to classical music in the so-so secondary. But also keep in mind, though, as you do your powerful primary homework, you're not really paying close attention to the class classical music. In fact, it's more or less background noise or white noise for a lot of people when they put on music and, they're, and studying. But let's say that your home, like you were, you were really a, a big classical music person, and you really appreciate all of the chords and, and instruments. Then, in that case, if you're trying to do your homework on math, you won't be able to catch all of those nice chords and nice melodies of the classical music because you can only do it so-so on a secondary track. Now, why are we starting off with all this psychology and neuroscience? I thought this is a business communication class. Here's why. Because there's a brain, another brain scientist named John Medina, who wrote a book called Brain Rules. He's a developmental neuroscientist, in fact. And he argued two things. Number one, that again, humans don't multitask, they switch tasks. They switch between doing a powerful primary and, and a so-so secondary, but you don't do many things very well at the same time. But he also said this. Humans tend to remember pictures more than they do words. Now here's the problem. If you ask the audience to read and listen to you at the same time, the audience can't do both at the same time. They will either read the PowerPoint well and listen to you somewhat and switch tasks between that, or they're going to listen to you and not be able to read the PowerPoint. But now, if you give the audience a picture to look at, and then you talk to them, the audience can look at the picture and listen to you talk, because they can look at the picture on a so-so level and still get the idea, because looking at a picture does not require a high cognitive load, but they can still listen to the words that you are saying. 
So all those things that I taught you in data visualization about making sure that your audience can follow what you're saying and to not distract your audience too much is actually rooted in neuroscience and brain science. Now, when we're presenting with PowerPoint then, we have another challenge. When we are presenting a, pre whenever we are giving a presentation, something is being projected onto a screen. And when something is projected onto a screen and it moves and you're delivering this presentation live, so we're assuming that this isn't a pre-recorded presentation. This is a live presentation you're giving, in, giving to the audience. There are three technical challenges that you face as a presenter when you're projecting. So we call these the projection challenges. First, you have the challenge of attention and really attention on two levels. First, you have to tell the audience what to look at on a PowerPoint slide. And often if your slides are busy, the audience's attention might go multiple directions because you put so many things on the slide. It, one person can start on the left, one person might start on the bottom. Even with the Z principle, something might distract an audience member as they flow down the Z and so forth. But you also have maintaining the attention span. So it's the getting them to look where you want them to look and stay there. So you have the problem of attention, getting the audience to look where you want them to look. But secondly, you have the problem of or challenge of temporality. When you're giving a slide presentation, the slides don't stay up there forever. You're going to be giving a slide and then you're going to move on to the next slide. Now, if your slides move too quick, the audience may not have a chance to really appreciate everything that's on the slide, depending on how much you put on there. So somehow you have to deal with this issue that if you show a slide to the, an audience member and the audience member didn't catch it, the, you may have lost that audience member for the rest of the presentation because maybe they really wanted to look at that slide and they can't rewind you and they may not feel comfortable asking you to repeat or go back because maybe you're giving an uninterrupted presentation. So temporality is a challenge. How do we make it so that whenever I show a slide, everyone's going to have enough time or at least enough processing power to get whatever it is that I want them to see on the slide? And then you have a third challenge, which is synchronization. When we talk about synchronization, we're talking about the slide deck being in sync with your speaking. You have to think of the slide deck as essentially music and you're speaking as the lyrics to the music. If you listen to a song and the, the lyrics are ahead of the music, the sounds, the song sounds out of sync. Or if the music gets ahead of the lyrics, then the sound, the song also sounds out of sync. Part of music is the lyrics and the music synchronized together. It's the same thing with PowerPoint. You have to know how do I get the PowerPoint to not get ahead of me so that the audience then directs their attention ahead of me and then doesn't pay attention to me, but also doesn't get behind me so then that the audience doesn't get confused. So that's synchronization. Here's the plan then for this lecture series. There are three general areas we're going to cover in these this three-part lecture. First, we're going to learn how to design to grab attention, how to create that flow so the audience knows where to look and they're not distracted by ornamentation or things that you don't need. So a very simple design that you all can learn to use. Secondly, you're going to learn how to create glance media. This is going to deal with the problem of temporality. The fact is PowerPoint is not a brochure. It's not a document. It's a slide. How do we create media that we can glance at? And that's, you're going to learn that through using specific elements and deploying those elements in effective ways so that the audience can glance. And then thirdly, we're going to learn how to synchronize the presentation because part of what needs to happen is you need to make sure that your slide deck is in sync with your actual talking as you give the presentation. If you can synchronize the presentation well, your PowerPoint becomes a combination of beautiful looking visual art and wonderful sounding music. And that's what we want. PowerPoint is supposed to empower whatever it is that you say. It's not supposed to replace what you say. It's supposed to empower it and give it more punch. So with these three things that we're going to learn in this lecture series, you should be able to do just that. Let's get to it. Let's start with designing to grab attention. The first part of this lecture series. There's two things, there's two questions we're going to ask. How do I arrange my slides and how do I thematize them? So let's start with how do I arrange my slide deck? What I'm going to show you are 
principles taught in typical graphic design classes. In graphic design, one of the things that you learn is learning how to grid layouts. And when you're talking about grids here, you're talking about creating columns, columns for which specific elements will fit. And so you see on this little newspaper here, there's columns that are perfectly matched and even the text is put into columns. So columns help align where all the elements are going to fit on to the, in this case, the newspaper page. And this is called a symmetric column. But what you also have to be aware of are, well, here's another example of columns. And you can see even your iPhone or your, presumably your Android phone, has a, a layout like this where everything's in neatly stacked rows and columns. So specific elements will go within those columns. You don't have something that's like in here where it looks a little dis disorganized or something over here. Everything is perfectly aligned just as, just with symmetry. Now, there's also these in, in here as well. You can see that there are columns here. Everything fits nicely in this magazine layout. And then you also have these things called modules. And so modules are little squares that go across the column. But even then, the module starts and stops within the boundaries of two columns right here. So you have columns and modules and figuring out a consistent layout where certain rules are followed in terms of how elements fit within the columns and how modules span the columns as well. And it's pretty consistent overall. And then you can get more complicated, like something like this, like a website where you have a column here and then a general column on you know this side. But then also, like you can see, there's a little module here and a module here and a module here, but they still respect a column generally. And then they make this a subsection, so then they can break the rule of the column here. So this is all part of layout. Have a consistent layout and think of your, your, your slide deck as sort of a grid. And how do I stay within the grids that I have set up? Now, one thing I want you to be able to do, and I know this is probably on your minds right now, is I want you to be able to create your own template. Now, some of you are probably wondering, but if I work for a company, they might already have a template. Yes, that is correct. So if you work for a company and they already have a template for you to use that has the colors, columns, themes, all those things, by all means, use your company template. But I wanna be able to teach you how to create your own in the event that there is not a company template that you're using, or you're presenting for a company that you're starting, or you're presenting for a venture that you're doing. So we wanna know how to do this. Now, one thing I want you to be able to also do is not use the, the templates that come up when you first open PowerPoint. You know the ones that there's like seven of them that are commonly used and it's like you just pick one and arbitrarily use that. We've all seen those templates before. Well, I want you to be more strategic in your design and to be more purposeful. So the idea to creating your own template is you wanna, one of the first things you wanna do when you go to PowerPoint is you wanna to go to view and you wanna to go to this part called Slide Master. And Slide Master essentially gives you the ability to create your own template. So whenever you create a new slide, you can set the colors, the font, the alignments, all of those things, and it makes building your slide deck go way quicker. And as you build your Slide Master, you'll be able to come up with colors and a layout that you think will work for you for your PowerPoint. Now, to create your arrangement then, you'll need to make decisions about your color, what font you're gonna use, what layout you're gonna use, and so forth. So this leads us to the second question, which is how do I thematize my slide deck? To thematize your slide deck means the following. How do you decide what components you want to use to give your slide deck a personality or a theme that speaks to the topic of the presentation? So there are four components to a theme and a slide deck. First, you have colors. What color scheme do you want to use for your slide deck? You can notice here that my color scheme actually matches the scheme of the PowerPoint logo, and I'll show you later. It's not TU colors, as some people will notice with the burnt orange. Secondly, it's font. What kind of font you're gonna use? I know there, I was watching a master class from some advertiser, from advertisers, uh, Silverstein, and I can't remember the other guy's name, but they both talked about how fonts serve as the voice of print. So you wanna pick a font 
that you think is going to serve as a good voice for the, the image that you're trying to convey or for the thought you're going to convey. And I'm going to go in each, I'm going to go over each of these in depth. So this is just a preview slide. Then there's also the weave. And I'll talk about what a weave is in a second. And then there are elements. So elements are your pictures, charts, graphs, all the things that you actually put into the slide that is that you manipulate. Let's start with the weave or what I call the weave in. When you decide how you're going to design your slide deck, the first question you should ask is what is my topic? And then what is, once you ask what your topic is, you should ask how can I weave the design of my slide deck to the topic? So in this case, I am weaving my slide deck to the, to the topic of PowerPoint by using the colors associated with PowerPoint. And in fact, on Mac, they have a little logo of PowerPoint and it has the, the little circle with the four, it has like four little parts. And I took those colors and I've copied those colors. I've also used the font that PowerPoint uses. This looks pretty similar to the P here. And that's how I'm weaving in this presentation about PowerPoint into the design decisions of what colors and fonts and such that I used. Now let's do a little exercise here and let's see what kind of creates creative weave-ins you can come up with with these different topics. Let's say you're giving a speech on increasing teacher pay. What might be some colors, some weave-ins that you can, you can employ if you're going to give a speech about increasing teacher pay? And then what about on investing in green energy? What might you deploy there? Or on criminal justice reform? Or on Amazon.com supply chain miracle? Go ahead and take a few seconds and think about this. How would I theme teacher pay? How would I theme green energy? How would I theme criminal justice reform? And how would I theme Amazon.com supply chain miracle? Go ahead and take a few seconds. If you need more time, go ahead and pause the video. Let's see what you came up with on increasing teacher pay. So naturally, if I'm giving a speech about increasing teacher pay, I would probably want my slide deck to have some sort of teacher theme to it. When I think of teachers, what do you think of? Well, what I think of is I think of chalkboards. I think of green and white. I think of maybe a little bit of red too, because of like the apple. Maybe I'll use like handwriting chalkboard font or something to speak to that aspect. Also, I like green because pay, pay, you think of dollar bills, you think of green like money. So I think that ties in really well. So you'll know, okay, maybe I'll use sort of a chalkboard theme when I'm showing certain things and show pictures of, of teachers and students. That's how you weave that. What if you're doing a, a, a slide on green energy or a whole presentation on investing in green energy? Well, what do you think of when you think of green energy? What are some images and colors that come to your head? Well, I think if you do green energy, I feel like green would be your color. And maybe you would do like planet earth type. I mean, depending on what type of green energy, if I, I maybe would think like planet earth, like blue and green and brown maybe too, because land is brown and maybe some white. And then like, if it's like hydraulic green energy, maybe you do a little bit heavier blue, or if it's solar power, maybe a little, maybe you add some red or orange for solar power. So these are some ideas to weave in the earth color and then give it like an earthy feel because it's that's what green energy is supposed to be about is saving the planet. What about criminal justice reform? Well, you can give it sort of a legal feel. You know how in law, when I think of criminal justice, I think of like a specific serif print that's like the Times New Roman type look or perhaps maybe something like law and order where you have the, the kind of the color scheme of that. Or maybe you'll go more the legalistic route, you know, when you think of courtrooms and such, depending on what aspect. So it depends on what aspect of criminal justice reform, I guess, if you're talking about like the court process, I think of courtrooms. So courtrooms have like the brown, like legal feel to it. If you're talking more like prison reform, you might go with like an orange and black or something like that. What about Amazon.com supply chain miracle? I kind of, I would probably, if this is Amazon, is this, if this is about Amazon.com, I would go to the Amazon.com website and see what colors they employ, what font they use, and just make it an Amazon theme. Because after all, the whole presentation is about Amazon.com. So I would use their font. I would use some of their colors and, and, and just their way of presenting things and just build the whole presentation around that because it's about Amazon.com. 
So this isn't necessarily about being flashy or, or being over the top. It's just your slide deck then matches the theme and it just makes more sense rather than just arbitrarily or randomly just picking colors and, and such. Now, when you pick a color scheme, let's say you have some open ideas or a lot of choices, you generally pick three to five colors for a color scheme. And you can do just two. I know that you can get away with just doing, doing just two, but it kind of just makes it very, I don't know, two dimensional, I suppose. So I like to have at least three and then probably no more than five. Now, when you pick a color scheme, you have different options. You can do something like a monochromatic scheme. So you see here, monochromatic means you're doing different shades and tints of the same color. You see how things get darker in red and then you have like this lighter uh, tinted ver uh, sh shaded version and then the tinted version. So like my, my presentation is more or less a monochromatic scheme because you have the lighter orange here and then sort of the darker, there's like a mid orange, it's not on this slide. And then you have something that's more on this end with, with this. So that would be more monochromatic. You can do something that's complementary. So you take two different colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, and then you take some of those. You might take a light of orange and a medium of blue and a dark of orange, perhaps, or a dark of blue and a light of orange and a, and a medium of, of blue, something like that. So there's options like that, so complementary. So you would need to look at a color wheel for that. Or you do analogous, so it's three colors that are next to each other or two colors that are next to each other on the color wheel. So you might do a dark blue here and then a light and then a very light turquoise as well here. The idea is just to be methodical, be methodical about how you pick your colors, but also consider some of the consequences of the colors you pick. There actually is a lot of psychology behind color choices and the impacts of colors on people. So on the, on the right here, you have cool colors and it's harder to define cool colors because it's like define red. Like, I don't know, red's not red. It's not, or red's not purple. It's not yellow. Like, how do you define it? If you were to explain red to somebody, how do you explain cool colors? I don't know, these colors over here, like <laughs> these darker colors on this side of the, of the wheel. But specifically, I want you to think about what the psychological effects of cool colors have on people. And one thing that we know for sure is cool colors tend to relax cool colors tend to exuberate calm and perhaps some evidence of this. Whenever you go to the doctor's office, you'll see a lot of blue or a dentist office. You'll see a lot of blue. The chair will be blue. Often the doctors or the dentists wear blue scrubs. A lot of things are blue because blue is associated with calm. If you go to a massage therapy place, often there's shades of blue involved. And so blue is a color that tends to be calming and cool and confident. The other thing about blue is that that color tends to fade into the back or dark colors tend to fade into the background. And we'll talk about why that matters in a second. On the opposite end, you have warm colors. Now warm colors are everything to the, to the left here of the, the color wheel here. And the unique thing about warm colors is warm colors tend to cause st uh, stimulation or incitement and or arousal in humans and uh, we're talking about arousal just like arousal of feelings and arousal of awareness the most common place you'll see warm colors deployed are you ready food a lot of fast food places deploy warm colors because it's supposed to try to stimulate hunger and action and then of course, when you're in these places, they don't want you there very long. They want you to get in and get out, like literally win an out burger, in and out, okay? So all of these places are fast food joints for a reason. They want you to get in and feel kind of, feel that stimulation of hunger, but also feel that stimulation of getting out. So warm colors have that high stimulation. Now, cool colors tend to fade, warm colors tend to, tend to stand out. When we talked about data visualization, remember we talked about emphasis and putting emphasis on a graph and focusing or focusing the graph. So if you want something to not be as noticed by the audience, put that in a cool or dull color. If you want the audience to know something, use a warm, bright color so that thing specifically stands out to the audience. Next, you also have to be aware when you're picking your colors, the effects of your foreground and background colors. So your foreground colors are the colors that you want us to focus on. The background colors are what contrast those colors contrast against. So even if you look at this chart, you can see that some foreground colors and background colors don't contrast well. 
You can see here that perhaps this doesn't have good contrast. I mean, these are concordant and you know, yellow and white. I still think that's hard to read. And you have to think about how things, certain things contrast against each other. So yellow doesn't contrast, like this bright yellow doesn't contrast on white, but it does contrast okay on, on gray, not so much on other brighter colors. Here's the idea. Whenever you're deciding a background color, you want it to contrast with a foreground color as much as possible. When we say contrast, we want them to be opposite ends of the spectrum. One's really dark and one's really light, or one's really bright and one's really dull. You don't wanna have two colors that are the same in that regard. You don't want two bright colors against each other. You don't want two dark colors against each other because it'll be too hard to read. Now let's talk about typography. Let's say you get to pick what kind of typography you use for your text. Well, the big decisions you'll have to make are what typography really speaks to the voice that I'm trying to get across here, but also do you want serif fonts or sans serif fonts? So these right here are serifs. So these are the little, little pointy things that go at the end of letters that just kind of add a, you know, just a specific look to the style of the, of the font. These are sans serifs because there's none of those little hangy dangly things on any of these. So these are sans serif fonts. So, I've heard so many contradictory things about serifs and sans serifs, but here's just kind of the rule of thumb I use. I think serif fonts are good for written communication that has to be read. Excuse me. So when you write an academic paper, serifs are good. Or when you're doing a resume, I think serifs are good as well. One argument that's made in favor of serifs for reading and written communication is the serifs help guide the eye as you read across because you have these little pointy things that kind of help you move to the next Whereas sans serifs, if you try to read like a three paragraph block of geo sans light, it's just hard to read because of all the equal spacing and whatnot. So for more modern looks, like on PowerPoints, I like sans serifs. So I usually, when I'm doing PowerPoint, I don't use serifs unless I'm going for a theme, like a legal look. So if I were doing something with the law, I might actually use serifs after all. But if I'm doing something in writing, I will use serifs. If I'm doing something on PowerPoint or graphic or visual, I like sans serifs. That's my rule of thumb. Other people may, may choose so differently. But the key thing is, whenever you're thematizing your deck, is to stay consistent in your design choices. So notice that this slide looks nothing like any of the other slides. Exactly, that's my point. I don't want you to go from one color and one font all the way to this new color and new font and all this stuff. What you want your slide deck to do is to be a deck of cards. Just like a deck of cards, how there is a theme that ties every deck together and the cards look like they go together, your slide deck should also operate the same way. Now, there's always times to break the rules. Like if you're really trying to get the audience's attention, like maybe it's the middle of the presentation and you just really want to, you just really want to grab their attention in a way they don't expect, then bust out like a really inconsistent slide and show it so the audience is thrown off guard. Wait, you you know, it's just way different. And then bring it back to the regular slide deck. So. There are times to break the rules, but generally if you're not doing that, if you're not just doing it to gain the audience's attention, just stick to your design choices. Now, lastly, there's elements. Now, in my data visualization lecture, I already talked a lot about text and smart art or your visualized text, if you will, and graphs. So I would refer you back to data visualization on how to do textual visualization and data and charts. But one thing we will talk about and this will be in the next lecture. We'll talk more about, we'll talk a little bit more about smart arts. So we will talk about this in a little bit of long quote slides, but we'll, you'll have more depth in the data visualization lecture, but we'll definitely talk about pictures and videos in the next part. So the type of elements you use also speak to the theme of the deck and also the elements are the content of the deck. So you wanna make sure that these are well deployed. So in review, how do I arrange my deck? it comes down to gridding. Come up with a good grid where you have consistent layout between items and modules. There's consistent spacing in terms of what goes where. You have those gutters in between and it's just consistent. Use the slide master as your guide to help build that consistent grid and that look. And then how do you thematize? Well, we talked about four different aspects of themes. So we talked about color, we talked about font, we talked about weave-ins, and then Really, in the next lecture, we'll talk more about elements. So, I will see you in Lecture 2, Part 2, Elements.